In this tutorial, we're going to look at rates of reaction. The first aim is to explain how to measure the effect of different factors on the rate of a chemical reaction, then explain rates of reaction using collision theory, and finally interpret rates of reaction graphs. So you may have noticed that our atmosphere isn't in a particularly healthy state. For over 100 years, we've been burning fossil fuels as if there was no tomorrow, and it's starting to have a significant impact on our environment. A lot of this can be attributed to our use of motor cars. The motor cars had a bit of a shady history in terms of environmental pollution. First, there were scares over lead poisoning because we used to put lead into our petrol. Lead is a very poisonous metal, and if inhaled or taken into your body, it will do serious damage, eventually causing death. And lead was everywhere in our atmosphere, but thanks to a man called Claire Patterson from the States, he fought the petrochemicals company to get lead out of our petrol and won. And I assure you that was no small feat. But we still release harmful chemicals into our atmosphere. Carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxides, all these things cause problems. But modern cars have been fitted with a device called a catalytic converter. Inside this you'd see a metallic uh, honeycomb structure with different metals like palladium, platinum. If you get catalytic converters hot enough, they have a huge surface area and they have metals which act as a catalyst. A catalyst is something which speeds up a chemical reaction without being used up in the process. And what happens, as harmful gases get passed over the catalytic converter, they get cleaned up. So they react with oxygen. Things like carbon monoxide will react with oxygen to produce relatively cleaner gases such as carbon dioxide and water vapour. Temperature and surface area and catalyst are all factors that affect a rate of reaction. And this sets up the topic nicely. So the most basic thing you should know is there are four things that affect a rate of reaction. Temperature, concentration of the reactants, surface area, and the use of a catalyst. You need to know how to experimentally test all four of these. Let's start with temperature. You can see in this picture here I've got two glow sticks. Now the light emitted from these glow sticks occurs due to a chemical reaction between the fluids inside the stick. When they react with each other, they emit light. You'll notice here that one is significantly brighter than the other. Why? Well, this one is in hot water and this one's surrounded by cold water. To practically investigate the effect of temperature on a rate of reaction. For example, I've got two conical flasks here. I've got the same volume of, let's say, an acid, such as hydrochloric acid. And I've put the same quantity of magnesium ribbon inside both. As the magnesium reacts, it will produce hydrogen. Any reaction which produces a gas, you could do this for. And the hydrogen will be sent out of the conical flask through the delivery tube into a gas syringe. All you have to do is time how much gas is produced every, say, 5 seconds or every 10 seconds. Up to you. Depends on how quick the reaction is. You can see the difference between these two conical flasks is this reaction is occurring at 20 degrees Celsius and this one at double the temperature, 40 degrees Celsius. So when these reactions take place, this is what you'd expect to see you would see one gas syringe moving faster than the other one. In other words, due to the effect of temperature, this one produces gas at a slower rate than this one. So every 10 seconds, you just read off here, right, let's say after 10 seconds, 20 centimeter cubed of gas is produced in this one, but 40 in this one. And that way you can compare the effect temperature has on the rate of reaction. But like with any sort of experiment, you must be clear on what you're measuring. So you're measuring the volume of gas produced over time, and you must keep all other things that could affect the rate of reaction constant. For example, the volume of acid, the same level of acid, the concentration of acid, so how many acid particles are actually dissolved in this liquid, and the surface area of the metal. We couldn't crush this up into a powder because that would affect the rate of reaction too. Now we're going to look at surface area and how that affects the rate of reaction. This can confuse students but have a look at this video and see if it makes sense. We've got two tablets. I'm going to crush one up, giving it a much larger surface area and I'm going to react these soluble vitamin C tablets in water. I should really put them in at the same time but I didn't have two hands spare. And you can see that one has completely dissolved and that's the one I put in later. And this one, there's still most of the tablet left. The point is, in a powdered form, we present a much, much larger surface area than a tablet form. Now, that's a bit confusing because you might think, well, I can see more surface there. But you have to think about it in a different way. For example, let's say we're doing a similar experiment to before, but this time we're changing the surface area, not the temperature. So you can see the magnesium ribbon here, and you can see I've chopped it up into four pieces. Now, look at this. 
Now imagine I was measuring the surface area. So let's add four units on this side, four on this side, one on this side, and one on this side. So I added them all together and gave me a surface area of 10 units. Really, it should be centimeters squared, but it's hard to represent that in this sort of diagram. Whereas this one, look, I've exposed one, two, three, four sides, each worth one, and here again, and here again, and here again. If you add all those up, it equals 16 units. So we have a larger surface area when we cut up the magnesium ribbon into smaller pieces. So just remember, when you powder something up or you cut it up, you increase the surface area. So just like before, this time you're measuring the volume of gas produced over time. And this is what you'd expect to see. Once again, where you have the largest surface area, you expect the reaction to occur faster. In other words, more gas produced in the same amount of time. Like before, make sure you control the volume of acid, concentration of acid, and obviously the temperature, because that also affects the rate of reaction as you saw before. So that must be kept the same. Both of these must occur at the same temperature. So now we're going to look at concentration. That's the quantity of particles dissolved in water, for example. So here I'm reacting an acid with sodium thiosulfate. When hydrochloric acid and sodium thiosulfate react, they form a cloudy substance. So you can measure how quick the reaction is by looking at how long it takes before an image placed below the reaction chamber disappears. So I've got two glass vials here, I've got a more concentrated solution here and a less concentrated solution of hydrochloric acid here. As the reaction continues, the cloudy precipitate formed will start to obscure this image, so I can stop the timer when I stop seeing this image. Have a watch. So you can see it's starting to go cloudy now, but this one's still clear. This one's more concentrated, remember that. Now it's really cloudy and now it's gone. So that's where I'd stop the timer. Now, you don't have to apply this to concentration. You could do temperature in the same way, but this works well if you're timing a precipitate reaction. So as you can see, we are increasing the concentration of the acid. So you can see there's only two acid particles here, more here, more here, and even more here. And the more particles there are, the quicker the reaction. So you can see here, with the lowest concentration, it takes 15 seconds, but with the highest concentration, only four seconds. In this one, you are just measuring the time for the mark to disappear, and you must control the volume of reactants and the temperature of the reactants. Notice how I didn't say um, surface area here, because we're not looking at magnesium ribbon or something you can powder up, we're looking at two solutions. Also, notice how this experiment only tells us how long the reaction took. It doesn't give us the rate of reaction, it doesn't tell us how much product is produced over time. So it doesn't give us a nice, interesting graph to interpret, but we'll look at that later. Finally, how do we investigate a reaction using a catalyst? A catalyst is anything which speeds up a reaction without being used up in the process. Some exams give you graphs which involve catalysts and they ask you which graph out of these four represents the use of a catalyst and you must look for one which has a horizontal line because it's indicating the mass of the catalyst isn't changing throughout the reaction. That's the point, it doesn't get used up, it doesn't get changed in the reaction so its mass always stays the same. What catalysts do is they speed up a reaction by lowering the activation energy needed to start the reaction. So imagine we have energy on the side here, time here. Imagine that we normally needed this quantity of energy. We needed to input that much more energy to get a reaction starting. Well, with a catalyst involved, we only need that much energy. So we've lowered the amount of activation energy needed. We no longer need this surplus amount. This is how they speed up reactions. Your body is filled with catalysts called enzymes. That's what makes it possible for the chemical reactions that keep you alive to take place at around 37 degrees Celsius. Without enzymes, you'd have to raise your body temperature to much, much higher temperatures that would kill you. So once again, we use the gas syringe method here. So let's say we've got magnesium and hydrochloric acid, but this time we have a catalyst in one of the solutions. As you might expect, the reaction which has the catalyst will be much faster than the reaction without the catalyst and make sure you control everything else. So you are measuring volume of gas produced over time to get a rate of reaction, but you must control the volume of acid, concentration of acid, the temperature of the acids, and the surface area of the metal, because I'm using a metal here. Just be aware of what you're using before you pick the controls. And that's how you explain how to measure the effect of different factors on the rate of a chemical reaction. So, so far we understand that different factors affect the rate of reaction, but we don't understand why. If you remember, chemical reactions depend on successful collisions. What does that mean? 
Well, let's say we've got two molecules which we need to react here. Now, for them to react, they must collide, okay? But they must collide in the right direction. So this one, they may collide here, but that doesn't help them react. Or this way, it doesn't help them react. Let's say for them to react, they have to be orientated in the right direction. So let's say face on here. And then they will react if they collide with enough force for the bonds to break and new ones to form. So they must have enough energy and they must collide in the right orientation for the reaction to occur. That is what I mean by successful collision. So let's watch that. So here we have the two reacting molecules, the reactants, which are coming together to successfully collide. So the reaction is taking place and we formed the products, the two molecules we intended to from the reaction. So remember, chemical reactions depend on successful collisions, not just collisions, successful ones. And the key idea here is that all these factors affect the frequency of successful collisions, how often these collisions occur. You see, if you increase these factors, they can increase the frequency of successful collisions. If you decrease these factors, they will decrease the frequency of successful collisions. I cannot overstate this enough. This is really important. Remember these words, frequency of successful collisions. Also, to conceptually help you understand this idea, imagine you've got a dodgem ring and you've got all these cars, but they're randomly moving around. Now, you know that they will collide with each other, but certain factors may affect how frequently they collide. The key idea here is that they're not being operated by us. They're just randomly moving around. So the idea is if you increase the temperature, you increase how much kinetic energy these particles have, and therefore they move faster. This increases the frequency of successful collisions. But if you lower the temperature, temperature represented by smaller arrows because now they're moving slower because they have less kinetic energy, then it decreases the frequency of successful collisions. So raising temperature will cause the reacting particles to have more kinetic energy which increases the frequency of successful collisions. This is a very good sentence to remember. Similarly, if you lower the temperature, the reacting particles have less kinetic energy, movement energy, which decreases the frequency of successful collisions. Back to our dodgem cars, this is a bit like, for example, cranking up the voltage that powers these cars so they move much faster you expect them to smack into each other more regularly that's the same as saying increasing the frequency of successful collisions by increasing the surface area what we're doing is basically chopping up or powdering up a solid into smaller parts this is a low surface area the magnesium is one solid lump and here it's been cut up into smaller parts and now it has a higher surface area a lower surface area will decrease the frequency of successful collisions as there will be a smaller area for the acid to react with, whereas a larger surface area will increase the frequency of successful collisions as there will be a larger area for the acid to react with, assuming, of course, that these particles are an acid. That's a bit like taking every one of these dodgem cars and instead of using one, you use four small dodgem cars that when you put them together add up to the size of a normal dodgem car. So imagine each one of these now represents four smaller cars and they're all random randomly moving around, you'd expect them to collide more frequently as well. Concentration is a measure of how much of the reacting molecules are dissolved in water or in a liquid. This represents a highly concentrated solution, this represents a low concentrated solution. A higher concentration will increase the frequency of successful collisions as there will be more reacting particles in the solution, whereas a lower concentration will decrease the frequency of successful collisions as there will be less reacting particles in the solution. This is a bit like just putting more dodgem cars in there and you'd expect more collisions or removing dodgem cars away and you'd expect less collisions per second or per minute. Finally, we know a catalyst is something which lowers the amount of energy needed for a reaction to occur. So if you don't have a catalyst, it basically will decrease the frequency of successful collisions as the reacting particles will need more energy to react. So they'll need this much energy, they need to be moving with this much force to react with these particles. Whereas in this one, adding a catalyst will increase the frequency of successful collisions as the reacting particles react with less energy. So you can see that this is the amount of energy needed for this reaction to occur now that a catalyst is holding these molecules. What catalysts essentially do is put the molecules under amount of pressure so less energy is needed to break them apart. A bit like putting a pencil in a vice and asking you to chop that pencil with your hand. It'd be easier to do it under a bit of pressure than if someone was just holding it without it being placed under pressure. So that's how you explain rates of reaction using collision theory. For the last part, we must learn how to interpret rates of reaction graphs. Examiners love this part, so learn it well. 
mainly because it's an excellent example of applying your science. So rates of reaction graphs look like this. The curve will always be like this. It will go up and then level off. So it will increase at first and level off. Why? Well, you can see on the axis, on the x-axis, you have time. And here, on the y-axis, you have an amount of product formed. So you can imagine during the course of a reaction, particles are smacking into each other and reacting and producing a product. So as the reaction continues, more product will be formed. But after a while, all the reacting molecules have reacted, so there'll be no more product formed. So that's why it levels off. So let's say this reaction is occurring at 20 degrees Celsius. What will be the effect if we increase the temperature? Well, if we increase the temperature, let's say we double it, we will increase the rate of reaction, okay? This is how you show it on a graph. Look, it's steeper, the curve is steeper, but also notice how the same amount of product is made at the end. So literally all we're saying is the same reaction takes place faster. So notice, let's say at this time here, you can see normally this much product is formed, but at a higher temperature, this much product is formed. If we were to cool the reaction down so it's occurring at 10 degrees Celsius, notice what happens. This time we have a less steep rise. You can see it's much more shallow, but it still reaches the same point eventually. Eventually it will all react to produce the same quantity of product. So the key thing to remember here is that if you have a steep climb, that indicates a faster rate of reaction and a more gentle climb or gentle increase indicates a slower rate of reaction. So now let's look at the same idea but changing surface area. Let's say this is the normal rate of reaction. What happens if we increase surface area? So now we've powdered up our calcium carbonate tablet or our magnesium, we've cut it into smaller pieces and we have a larger surface area. As you might expect, it's a faster rate of reaction, more product formed in the same amount of time. So once again, we have a steeper climb, but we still have the same amount of product formed because we still have the same quantity of reacting particles to react together. And if we decrease the surface area, so we just have a big lump of magnesium or a big tablet, then obviously the reaction is slower. And that's represented again by a more gentle climb. But notice how they end up at the same point because the same total amount of product is made. So what about when we use a catalyst? Well, let's look without. So without a catalyst, let's say this is the normal rate of reaction. I'm sure you can predict what will happen when we add a catalyst. Catalysts speed up rates of reaction significantly. So again, we have a steep climb, much steeper than the original one, steep increase, and then levels off because we have the same amount of product formed. Adding a catalyst doesn't increase the amount of product formed. We still have the same quantity of reacting molecules to start off with. Now I'm looking at concentration, and this is different to the others in one critical aspect. So let's say this is your standard concentration. This is a normal rate of reaction. What happens if we throw more reacting particles in there? So if we double the concentration, look what happens to the line. Not only does it get faster, the rate of reaction, but because we're actually adding more reacting molecules in there, that means more product will be formed. So that's why the leveling off line is much higher than the original line. So remember, with concentration, you also have to take into account the product quantity. Similarly, if we halve the concentration, then we're taking away some of the reacting particles, so we'll get a slower rate of reaction, less frequency of successful collisions, but also you'll get less product formed because you don't have as much uh, reacting particles in there. So here are all the graphs in one eye shot. Learn them well, particularly remember this one because it's the only one where the quantity of product changes as well. And that is how you interpret rates of reaction graphs.